uh, his blessing. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for the light of the world. We thank you for Jesus, and we pray this morning that we would be able to see that light, even in dark places, that today is a day to celebrate and to be merry, to rejoice in the completed work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, show us Christ this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this morning we're looking at Revelation 12. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 17. I had the whole chapter printed out, uh, which includes verse 18, which really is, is not a good chapter break, so you'll see it on the screen, but I'm just going to read through verse 17 this morning. Hear now and listen to the word of the Lord from Revelation 12. A great portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pangs in the agony of giving birth. Then another portent appeared in heaven, a great red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. So there she can be nourished for 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Messiah. For the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. But they have conquered Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they did not cling to life even in the face of death. Rejoice then, you heavens, and those who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent into the wilderness to take her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. Then from his mouth the serpent poured water like a river after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to help the woman. It opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's not Christmas until Hans Gruber falls from Nakatomi Plaza. Those of you old enough to get that reference. Yeah, you already know uh, I have a certain affection for the movie Die Hard, and every uh, year there is a debate about whether it is a Christmas movie or not. The answer, of course, is yes, it is. Now, I know why people argue against it being a Christmas movie. It is, uh, granted, a violent action movie, and Christmas is all about peace on earth. But I wonder if that's really the full story the Bible gives us. Is the biblical account of Christmas really like a hallmark, feel-good Christmas movie? Or is it perhaps a little bit more like an action film, Die Hard. Philip Yancey, in one of his best books, The Jesus I Never Knew, he reflects on the Christmas cards he received one year and all the scenes that are depicted on those cards, scenes with cute animals, you know, you've seen these things, little gray mice, 
radiant red cardinals in the snow. Some of the cards depicted angels, and the angels are always kind of a little chubby, you know, a little chibi-like. They got a little they're cute and demure kind of creatures, childlike in appearance. And of course, uh, when Mary and Joseph and Jesus are depicted, they're often in these scenes of these kind of pastoral scenes of peace, these serene images. And after reflecting on those cards, Yancey writes in his book about how radically different a particular account of Christmas is in the Scripture, the one I read from you from our text, Revelation 12. Yancey writes this, There is one view of Christmas I have never seen on a Christmas card, probably because no artist, not even William Blake, could do it justice. Revelation 12 pulls back the curtain to give us a glimpse of Christmas as it must have looked from somewhere beyond Andromeda. Christmas from the angel's viewpoint. The account differs radically from the birth stories and the Gospels. Revelation does not mention shepherds and, or an infanticidal king. Rather, it pictures a dragon leading a ferocious struggle in heaven. What I want you to see uh, this morning in our time together is a little different view of Christmas, a different angle on Christmas. I want you to see a cosmic view of Christmas, a view you won't see on a Hallmark card, a view that you could characterize as a diehard Christmas. So come and look at this story we have in Revelation 12, this different view of Christmas with me. And I want to look at three things this morning, very simple, three things. I want to look at the characters of the story, who are our characters in this tale. Secondly, I want to look at the conflict of the story. What is the plot tension? What is going on here in this story? And then finally, I want to think about the consequence of the story. What is significant about this account of Christmas that it is included in Holy Scripture? What is it teaching us about the true and enduring meaning of Christmas? So very simple outline, the characters, the conflict, the consequence of the Christmas story of Revelation 12, the die-hard Christmas. First, let's look at the characters of our story. And there are really, there are more than three, but there are three main characters in this story. And the first one, of course, is the woman about to give birth, the pregnant woman in the story in the account of Revelation 12. Now, who is this woman? Is this Mary being depicted for us here? Well, not particularly, not directly Mary, it's inclusive of Mary, I think, but not directly. I think The woman here, and most commentators agree with this, is the church. That this is a representation of the church. And and particularly here, the church of the Old Covenant, Israel itself. Israel was, according to the Scriptures, the womb of the Messiah. That part of the unique calling of Israel, the nation of Israel, was to bring forth, to birth from it, the Messiah, the one who would be king. Paul puts it this way in direct terms, Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. Hear this, Paul writes, They are Israelites, and to them belongs the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belongeth the patriarchs, and from them, Paul says, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah who is over all God blessed forever, amen, from them, from the womb of Israel, comes forth the Messiah. As one commentator describes, the woman is the true Israel in her pre-Messianic agony of expectation. Israel gives birth to the Messiah. The woman here is the church of God. The second character, of course, is the child. Now, who is the child? This is obviously an easy one, right? I mean, if you get this one wrong, you're in big trouble. Uh, The child, of course, is the Messiah, is Christ Himself, and the text makes that very clear. 
In verse 5, uh, particularly, it says, And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who's to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That's a reference to Psalm 2, one of the classic messianic psalms that speaks of a king coming, one who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. The child is Jesus. And of course, in verse 10 of chapter 12, we read, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Messiah. The child is Christ. The woman is the church. The child is Christ. And our third character is, of course, the dragon. Now, who is the dragon? The dragon represents Satan, represents the devil, represents the serpent, represents the adversary, the enemy, the deceiver. That power that always seeks to thwart God's plan and resist and attack God's people. Revelation 12, verse 9, the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth. John leaves no doubt about it that the dragon is the great adversary. Those are the characters in this account. We have the woman who is the church, the child who is the Christ, the dragon who is the adversary or the serpent. Now let's think about point number two, the conflict in the story. What is the action in this action film? What is driving the narrative? What is the conflict among these characters? Well, you can see the immediate conflict in the text, right? It's all about conflict. It's all conflict, action words, language about war. The dragon tries to devour the child. God snatches the child up to the throne. The woman flees into the wilderness. You can feel the verbs, right? This is a moving, action-oriented text. There's a battle going on, a war. And it's just one battle, though. It stretches way back in time and encompasses the whole story of of the Scriptures and even continues now to this day. Revelation 12 describes a long war. A war, a conflict that's first revealed to us in Genesis 3.15 where we hear just after the fall in the curse about this enmity. The enmity that will be there between the woman and the serpent, between her offspring and his offspring, there will be this conflict down through the ages between the serpent and the woman and her child. And that's the story of Scripture. This is a long war and there are many battles in it, but they were all around this one objective. The serpent wanted to kill either the woman or the child, either the church or the Messiah. And you see that play out. It plays out immediately for Adam and Eve, right? With Cain and Abel, what happens? Cain kills Abel, and you think for a moment, that's it. The seed of the woman is doomed, right? This is done for, but then Seth is born as Eve brings forth a son, She cries out, God has granted me another child in the place of Abel. That's the pattern. That's the conflict. And it gets repeated and repeated over and over again. And so often, the serpent will find a human servant, some type of servant, some power source to do his bidding. We see it play out when Israel is taken into slavery, right? The woman is brought into slavery and Pharaoh serves that role to try to destroy the woman. But Joshua and Moses serve as deliverers brought from God. We see it in the time of King Saul. Another battle happens where David is to be, right? The Messiah is to come from David's line and Saul throws a spear at David twice. But David eluded him. And the serpent loses again. It's a story told over and over and over again. And even when we get to the Christmas story, what happens? The serpent finds another servant in Herod. And Herod seeks to kill that child, but he is outwitted. 
But the adversary persists. He goes after the child, the Messiah in the wilderness, confronts the Christ, but again fails. So he takes hold of Judas and the religious leaders and the Romans, and Christ is crucified. And for a moment, you think the war is lost, right? He got the seed of the woman. But then the Christ rises, the Messiah rises. He dies hard, doesn't he? You can't kill him. Even when you kill him, he rises again in this long struggle. This is a long war, a long conflict, and Revelation 12 is telling part of that story. And it's a struggle, by the way, that continues now because Revelation 12 tells us that even though the victory is won, even though the seed of the woman has won the victory, the dragon, the serpent becomes angry, right? And what does he do? He pursues, in verse 17, the rest of her children to make war on those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. The dragon comes for the church. And he's still coming. This is still the story of what you are part of this Christmas day. There's a struggle that remains. A struggle between principalities and powers and high places that Paul speaks about. It's why he tells you to put on the armor of God because there is a struggle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. This is a conflict of the ages, a long war, this tension, this warfare, a story of a die-hard Christmas that you won't find on a Christmas card, but is real nonetheless, one you will find in the Bible. That's the conflict of our story. It's a long, enduring, continuing conflict to this day. So we've looked at the characters, we've looked at the conflict in our story. Lastly and thirdly this morning, the consequence of our story, the importance and significance of this Christmas story. Why am I telling you this? Why does it matter? What are we to take away? What are we to do with this knowledge that we have from the Scriptures? Well, what I want you to see is that the Christmas story is a story of consequence. It's a serious thing, right? It's, it is a time to be merry, but it is a serious story. But often in our culture and even in the church, we tend to trivialize that story. We eviscerate it of its gravity. We neuter it. We domesticate the story. I mean, this is certainly true in our culture, right? Think about the cultural approach to Christmas and what it's all about, right? And it's easy for pastors to rip on that, right, and do that whole thing. But you kind of see it in the, even in the Christmas songs. How silly, how trivial those songs are. There are some really bad Christmas songs, right? Give me one, come on. What's a horrible Christmas song? All I want for Christmas, Gary, I love you, brother. People love that song. I think it's a crime against humanity. <laughs> Give me another one. Yeah, Grandma got run over by a reindeer. What are we doing? Conflict. I saw mom. Yeah, I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. That's problematic in a lot of ways. Think about that poor kid. What's, what's he thinking when he gets up and sees that? There's one, uh, as an Italian-American, I cannot stand. Dominic the donkey. I'd like to say it was somehow, you know, uh, you know defaming. It was written by an Italian guy, so I can't really, you know, complain too much. But uh, in the Rolling Stone, they, they rated the worst Christmas songs, and they said about this one, it's a spiritual cousin to the chicken dance. <laughs> it's a horrible one. Yeah, there's a whole bunch. We could go on with those things, but you get it, right? There are these weird, I don't know what, it's kind of crazy, right? It, it kind of turns it into a silliness, a trivialization, a sentimentalism. And we kind of would expect that, right, from the culture, but it happens in the church. We often rob Christmas of its 
consequence, of its importance, when we kind of depict it as kind of like a Disney film, an unrealistic, unrealistic, detached story that ignores the fact that we live in a real world of struggle and conflict. Right? It's all around us. And yet we come to Christmas and we do the hallmark thing rather than the diehard thing. We often embrace a Christmas without conflict, without consequence. I was reading an article by Russell Moore, and he was sharing an account when he was in a local bookstore in the Christmas season, and he was hearing a man ranting about uh, a particular Christmas uh, album by an artist and how horrible it was, and, you know, Moore is listening to this, kind of half agreeing with that, but then thinking this guy, he says he hates all Christmas music, and he was thinking this guy was a Grinch, but then the guy said why he hates Christmas Christmas music, and this is what he said. He said, it's boring. He said, Christmas is boring because there's no narrative tension. It's like reading a book with no conflict. And more thought about that for a moment, and that conversation occurred in the context of uh, some terrible events around that season, and one of uh, the awful national mass shooting incidents, even as we have seen in these last couple of days at malls. And Moore writes this, he says, For him, that is the guy he was hearing, the tranquil lyrics of our Christmas songs couldn't encompass such terror. I think he has a point. The first Christmas carol, after all, was a war hymn. Mary of Nazareth sings of God's defeat of his enemies, about how in Christ he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. There are some villains in the mind there. Simeon's song likewise speaks of the falling and rising of many in Israel and of a sword that would pierce the heart of Mary herself. Even the light of the Gentiles he speaks about is in the context of warfare. God's light overcomes the darkness and frees us from the grip of the devil. And then Moore concludes this. In a time when we seem to learn of a new tragedy each day, the unbearable lightness of Christmas seems absurd to the watching world. But even in the best of times, we all know that we live in a groaning universe, a world of divorce courts and cancer cells and concentration camps. And he's right. The church should not trivialize Christmas because you've seen the Bible doesn't trivialize it. It puts it in this context of a life and death struggle. And I think that's the benefit of remembering a die-hard Christmas story. It's remembering that this is a story of consequence. It is not a trivial story of serene and pastoral image. It is a struggle, a conflict a drama, a tragedy. There is suffering just like we see in the world around us. It makes us engage the truth of the world. A world in which this battle still rages. A world in which principalities and powers do evil and wicked things. A world in which a war rages in Ukraine and Gaza. A world in which two billion people lack access to safely managed drinking water. A world in which 27 million people suffer from human trafficking worldwide. A world in which white supremacy, anti-Semitism, and other forms of hate gain new adherence every day. And the Christmas story of Revelation 12 reminds us that Christmas and that life is a real struggle, an enduring struggle, a struggle between good and evil. That's the consequence of this story. That's its significance for us to remember today. Now, I realize this may not be the feel-good Christmas morning sermon that you would have wanted. Uh, if I've done that, then I've kind of succeeded, I guess, at my goal. Unless you consider me a uh, Grinch, uh, let me end on an upbeat note. Because Christmas does end on an upbeat note, doesn't it? Even Revelation 12 ends on an upbeat note because the war is won. Right? Jesus does die hard. You can't kill him. And even when you do, he rises again. And the church will not be destroyed. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
The victory is won. The great theologian Oscar Kuhlman put it in these terms that the first advent of our Lord was like D-Day and the second advent is V-E Day. The war was basically won on D-Day. It was just a matter of time at that point. Just a matter. Not that it wasn't bloody. Not that there wasn't sacrifice and loss and horror. But the victory was won. It was just a matter of time. And as Satan knows in the Scripture itself, his time is short. And so today we sing of a victory song. We sing with Miriam. We sing with Mary. We sing about a victory, a song of redemption. Because in the end, that's really what separates the Christian apart from the world. It's not that we don't experience the struggle or see the struggle. It's that we know how it ends. And we have hope in the victory of Christ. We have something to sing about. That's really the difference. Let me close with this illustration from uh, the comedian Steve Martin. Don't worry, it's not too bad. <laughs> it's actually a really good point he makes. But I want to end on a light note. So in 2011, Steve Martin appeared on The Late Show with David Letterman, and he produced what he called the entire atheist hymnal. And it was on one piece of paper. <laughs> it had one song in the hymnal. And uh, he said the song was entitled, Atheists Don't Have Songs. <laughs> and here's how the one song goes, Atheists Don't Have Songs. This is what Martin wrote. Christians have their hymns and pages Hava Nagilas for the Jews. Baptists have the rock of ages. Atheists just sing the blues. Romantics play Claire de Lune. Born again sing he is risen. But no one ever wrote a tune for godless existentialism. <laughs> for atheists, there's no good news. They'll never sing a song of faith. In their songs, they have one rule. The he is always lowercase. That's the difference. We have something to sing about. The Christian has something to sing about because the victory has been won. This great conflict has been won by our Lord. And when we sing, the he is always in uppercase. We sing about a victory, the victory of our Lord. So let's close this sermon by doing just that. Would you please rise together? As we sing about the victory of our Christ in singing together hymn number 92, Joy to the World.